Hi guys, Olive here, here today to discuss and review two books on slime. The first book I'll be talking about is called Slime, A Natural History by Susan Vedlick and translated into English from the German by the translator Eiji Tergola. This book was published in 2023 by Melville House, which is an independent publisher, and the hardcover copy that I checked out from my local library comes in at 336 pages. This book is about the disconcerting and yet oh so important substance that we call slime. And this science writer author is very wise to open up this book with an acknowledgement of the obvious. It grosses us out. It is somehow a solid and a liquid at the same time. It's very hard to define, but this author says that it exists somewhere in between a sluggish fluid and a creepily soft solid. It moves in an unnatural way. I mean, it seems to scream at us that disease and death lie ahead, which is probably why it is so closely attached to horror flicks and science fiction novels. It gives us the ick, and not for no reason. The earliest sections of this book take on our perceptions of slime, all the social learning that takes place that instills within us this innate response to steer clear of it for often very valid reasons. And then how that has translated into the different types of cultural depictions that we know of slime that make it the perfect prop for a Halloween party. But after she's done discussing everything from Ghostbusters to the human disgust response, she talks about about how we as readers should push past all of that to read a whole book on the stuff. Because even though we are repulsed by all things ooey gooey, we're liable to forget that they serve as the basis of our biology. We originated from them, and they still serve myriad critical functions here on Earth, which includes inside of our bodies. What follows those earliest sections are seven themed parts in which she discusses all of those functions. And she begins every chapter within the larger parts with a short anecdote that initially seems like it's coming from out of nowhere, but you'll see that it has something to do with the information that she's eager to share. And she's eager to share it because it is fascinating. Like she talks about how cells use a slime barrier to protect themselves from pathogens. It has also allowed us land creatures the ability to breathe outside of the ocean because it keeps our passages hydrated and as free from harmful microbes as possible. Then she discusses the ways that other creatures on Earth use and really rely upon slime to get by. Some of them use it to protect themselves with, others use it to hunt with. There are some plants that cover their seeds in a type of slime, using the sticky nature of it to help allow those seeds to venture further out into the world, they'll have a better chance of survival. Other animals use slime for other reproductive purposes. And then there are the creatures like jellyfish, who are almost entirely composed of the stuff. It makes them more buoyant. Slime is so important that life very likely arose from it, although not in the primordial ooze way that Ernst Haeckel theorized. You can look forward to hearing about how that theory was debunked in this book. But to counter that theory, Vedlik also discusses what we currently understand about how life likely originated and how some of that probably happened under a cover of slime. By the time you reach the end of this book, you will have pushed right past that gag reflex and you will have acquired a taste for slime, so to speak. Anyway, at the very least, the word slime won't just bring to mind images like flubber or those creepy alien-like slime molds pulsating like they're plotting something. Instead, you will see that slime is so much more than that. It's something essential. It's something that we need inside of our bodies. It's something that other creatures rely on just to get through every single day. And it is also something that we can thank for our mere existence here on Earth. And beyond all of that, it's just really cool. I have to give a ton of credit to this book, to this author, for being able to pull off that kind of a magic trick to turn something that previously grossed you out into something you can't learn enough about, that's really impressive. And I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that this author is clearly so fascinated by slime. Her enthusiasm for this topic, you can feel as you read this book, and it's absolutely infectious which may not be the best choice of words given this subject matter, but you get it. The writing is scientific, but it is also just downright fun. 
those anecdotes that start off the chapters that I mentioned earlier, they really have a way of pulling you in. If only because at first you'll find yourself wondering, where is she going with this? Because they do seem very out of left field, but her intention becomes clear very quickly. And my fellow lovers of short chapters out there, rejoice, this book is dominated by short chapters and it makes flying through this book a breeze. I also wanted to take a moment to note that this book is expertly translated. Like if I hadn't have known that this book had been translated into English, if it wasn't prominently displayed on the cover of this book, I never would have guessed that this book was translated because it reads so naturally in English. I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye out for future works that this author translates into English because this was great. Something else I wanted to mention, though, although I thought this book overall was fantastic and I absolutely do recommend it, there was something that I felt was a little bit lacking, and that was the absence of a proper conclusion. And maybe that was more noticeable for me because this book had such a robust intro with all of the cultural and pop cultural things that we got to learn about. It really was this great appetizer that led us into the entree, the meat of the actual book. But then we didn't get really any kind of a conclusion. The only thing we got was this tiny little afterword that served more to wrap up the final part within the book than do what a proper conclusion is supposed to do, which is reiterate the things that this author wants you to come away from the book with, this book just didn't have it. So I've turned that final page and was like, oh, that's it. It was really disappointing. So I do have to take off some figurative points for that. But other than that, I thought this book was a delight. You will never look at ooze the same way again. And you might want that buffer before going on to read the second book I'm going to be talking about, also called Slime, except the subtitle of this one is How Algae Created Us, Plague Us, and Just Might Save Us by Ruth Cassinger. This book was published in 2019 by Mariner Books, which is an imprint of HarperCollins, and my paperback copy that I purchased with my own money comes in at 320 pages. This is a book about a different kind of slime algae and the role it plays in our lives. And we learn very early on in this book that what we call algae is actually three separate things. So first, there's the simple blue-green algae, which is also known as cyanobacteria. Then there's microalgae, and those first two together are what are known as phytoplankton. And then the third thing is what I think most of us think of when we say the word algae. The third type is macroalgae or the kind that we see. This author is also very quick to point out that, perhaps contrary to popular belief, algae are not plants. Instead, they are sunbathers. That means that they're much simpler than a plant, but they're also far more productive. They have one goal and one goal only, and that is to multiply themselves. And they're very good at it. We have an abundance of algae, in some places an overabundance. It is a highly renewable, renewable resource. And we currently do have a lot of different uses for algae, and there may be even more in the future. This book is divided into four different sections. The first one looks at how algae originally evolved and how it took over. The second is all about how we as people consume algae, meaning eating it, and how it gets onto our tables. The third section is all about individuals who have discovered different uses for algae beyond just simply ingesting it. And then the fourth section is environmentally focused, discussing things like the power that algae has to clean up pollution or positively affect climate change. There's a conversation that the author has in the second section of this book, the one about eating algae, that has really stayed with me because she talks about how eating seaweed was likely once very important for human brain development. And she says this because, and I didn't even know this, iodine deficiency was once exceedingly common for people. It was really hard for people to get enough iodine, and it had a lot of negative side effects in the human body. Like, it was noticeable if you weren't getting enough iodine in your body. But seaweed has a ton of it. On top of the fact that it's full of fiber and protein and a whole host of other vitamins and minerals, it is a nutritional 
powerhouse. There's a reason why the Japanese eat a lot of nori, which is dried seaweed. We should really eat more of it here in the Western world. But beyond just eating it, we do have myriad other uses for algae currently, and then there are even more potential uses that are under development right now, and this author talks about those. But as she's going through discussing all of these existing products and potential products, she talks about the difficulties that companies face actually getting these things to market. Because even if research and development for these things goes off without a hitch, which it rarely ever does, the biggest challenge arises when these companies are trying to get the prices of these replacement products, they're replacing products that already exist out there, the prices need to be low enough to be able to compete with those existing products. And that's really hard to do when you have so much money put into just researching the product in the first place. As many of us know, it's expensive to go green. Although there is a discussion toward the back of this book about what we're currently seeing and can expect to see from algae as climate change continues to intensify, I would say that overall, this is a book that I think is a lot more about industries and commercial uses for algae. It kind of sits at the intersection of science and business, it, rather than being a straight up nature book, which is not something I was off put by. I definitely would have still picked up this book, even if that had been clear to me going in. It's just that I don't think that's very clear when you go into this book. I think the title and or cover of this book could have done a much better job at at least hinting at what this book actually is dishing out. But this was really interesting stuff. There's a bit of adventure to it, since the author is traveling from place to place to learn about all of these algal advancements. I did find myself wondering, though, throughout the book, if there have been any new developments toward any of these products. I mean, this book was published in 2019, meaning that the author probably wrote it in the years immediately preceding 2019. And I know that seems like it hasn't been that long, but especially in our modern world, things move so quickly. So I am wondering if there's been any progress towards some of these products, because I personally would love to be using seaweed sunscreen or pumping my gas tank full of oil derived from algae. But I guess until those things are actually realities, I'll have to settle for munching on some seaweed snacks. And just like with the previous one, this book will very likely change your perspective on algae. I mean, who knew that such simple organisms could pack such a serious punch in so many different rings? They're good for the health of coral reefs, but they're also good for our health. And we very likely will be seeing them in many products in the future. This wasn't exactly what I was expecting from this book, but I learned a lot and had a lot of fun along the way. So those were my thoughts on these two books on slimy things. Let me know in the comment section below if one or even both of these appealed to you. If you want to get your hands on a copy of one or even both of them, there will be links in the description box below to where you can do that. And also in the description box below, I've included something that I like to call the further reading section, where I've listed out some other book titles you might want to check out if this topic interests you. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.